Uh, we're going to look this morning at the second half of a lesson we looked at last week um, on growing up God's way, and this is going to be part two. I couldn't come up with a better title than that. Just growing up God, God's way, part two. We looked uh, two weeks ago at Jesus' early life. We don't have a lot of information, but we do have a lot at age 12 when he went to the temple and what he did there, uh, sitting among the teachers of the law, uh, listening to them, asking questions. And then all of a sudden we fast forward in Scripture to age 30, where Luke tells us that's when he began his ministry. But we're given two short commentaries about what Jesus' life looked like in his early stages. And Luke gives those to us in verse 40 and in verse 52. So this is what we looked at uh, last week. Let me just uh, go to these two areas. All right. We see that Jesus grew up uh, four ways, physically, mentally, spiritually, and socially. Uh, verse 40, speaking of Jesus, it says, around age 12, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So here Luke describes Jesus as simply growing up from his earliest days to about age 12. He becomes strong, so he's growing like a normal boy would grow. Even though he was both God and man, that does not mean that he had some supernatural power that he was exerting that changed the way he grew up. He grew up just like any other young boy would. But it says he was filled with wisdom as he grew up, and the grace of God was upon him. So he was growing up the right way which all young people should uh, want to do, and that should be the desire of their parents or guardians as well, to help them grow up the right way. Then we looked at verse 51 and 2. It says, at age 12, he went down to Nazareth with them, that's his parents, and was obedient to them. Okay, that's part of God's will, be obedient. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Then verse 52. And as Jesus grew up, he increased in wisdom, and in favor with God and with people. So we're shown here four ways in which Jesus grew. He grew physically, and that's simply found in those two words, he grew up. So he grew up as a young boy physically, mentally. Uh, he increased in wisdom. So his mind was growing as his body was growing. But he also grew up spiritually. He grew up in favor with God. His life was going the same direction God wanted his father uh, wanted his life to go. And then he grew up in favor with others and with people. That means he grew socially. Well, what I want to do today is look at how that... Again, I'm going all over the place because something didn't come out right. But we're going to look at how this reflects itself in our spiritual growth. We looked at what life should look like for simply a young person in their teens and in their early 20s. But what would this look like spiritually? Because we find in Scripture that God wants us always growing from the day that we're baptized. Uh, we're described as simply infants in Christ. Or I remember the old King James said, uh, babes in Christ. Uh, that was the description Peter gave for those who are young in their faith. And as believers, we're always growing, even though our physical growth will... Uh, plateau, our spiritual growth never ends and is always to be present even until the day uh, God calls us home. So I want to look at these four areas, physical, mental, spiritual, and social, from a spiritual standpoint. That is how God sees us. All right, the first thing we ought to do is simply work towards physical growth. Well, you might say, John, I, what, what do you mean? Uh, as an adult, I work towards physical growth. Um, I, I finished growing when I was in middle school, and for me that was literally the case. I stopped around 7th grade at 5'7". I tried mightily to be taller, I wanted to play uh, different positions on the football team than I was playing, but my body did not cooperate. And I simply plateaued out. Our physical growth will end at some point, early in life. We won't get any taller. We might try to fight off extra pounds that want to grow, but we're not going to usually get taller. But spiritually, as God looks at us as we grow in Christ, we're always growing. Well, you might wonder, well, how is that? First of all, understand that your body belongs to God. I want to look at some texts that talk about how we see our physical body 
and how that it continues to grow in the eyes of the Lord even though it stopped growing physically. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. What I want you to do this morning, I finally figured out. I sent, you, I sent the wrong thing. You're looking at my preliminary thoughts on this lesson. I wondered why it didn't fit. My lessons are always a work in progress. But I sent Nathaniel the wrong thing. I want you to just go where I say, because what is here won't fit. Some things will, but some things won't. The 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, look what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian Christians about their physical body and how they ought to see it as Christians. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins people commit are outside their bodies. But those who sin sexually sin against their own body. Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. So here, as Paul is teaching against sexual sin, he says, when you involve yourself with the wrong person and in the wrong way sexually, you are actually sinning against your own body. Because you're involving your physical form with someone else in a wrong way. But then he gives the reason why that's true. He says your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. This idea that our bodies are just ours to do whatever we want with them is simply wrong. We know when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized not only in water, but in the Spirit. And in multiple places in Scripture, the Lord tells us that the Spirit of God comes to live within us, within our bodies, upon new birth. Now, the Holy Spirit works through the Word, but He also lives within our bodies. The Spirit of God has taken up residency with us. So therefore, our bodies is not something just to do whatever we want with it. He says we were bought at a price. When Christ died for us, not only did He forgive us of our sins, but we also became in this position, or we entered into the position of belonging to God. He paid for us through the blood of His own Son. We don't belong to ourselves. So someone who is a believer in Christ cannot say, well, my body is mine to do whatever I want with it. It's not the case. If you want to just do whatever you want with your body, you can't be a Christian. They're incompatible. Our physical bodies belong to God. And therefore, Paul says in verse 20, you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Well, how do we do that? How do we work towards this level of physical growth, which is simply God's view of our growth? Well, first of all, understand that our body belongs to God. So wherever, uh, whatever God says that directs how we use our body, that's what we are to do. We are to determine to honor God with our body. Uh, first of all, that means we protect it. We protect it physically all the time anyway. I assume most people here are always wearing their seatbelt, right? And your shoulder harness when you drive. We do that. We take medications and vitamins and things like that. We go to our doctor to get a physical examination. We're always looking out for our physical body. We exercise. We make sure we engage in activity because we want to preserve our physical body. But God is saying, you also preserve your body for me. Our body is a sanctuary for God to live in. We respect not only its ability to do what it should, uh, that's why we don't give ourselves an addiction to any substance, whether it be alcohol or drugs, because our mind is always to be clear, and that's why the Bible condemns drunkenness, because we take our mind and our body out of submission to God when we are under the control of substances or alcohols. We simply don't do that. We don't just pursue whatever sexual course of action we want to engage in, simply because our body belongs to God. So if you're thinking of your life in the terms of physical growth as a Christian, you protect your body. It belongs to God. 
And you only use it in ways that He directs. And you make sure you're always clear in your mind and your body for what God wants you to do. Protect and honor your body. We also work towards mental growth. We work towards mental growth. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. First, God's looking at our body to make sure that we understand it belongs to Him and we don't use it to chase after things that are wrong and we preserve it for His use. But He's also looking at our mind. Again, Jesus grew up. He grew in wisdom. Look at how God wants us to use our minds. Verse 1 and 2, the book of Colossians. Chapter 3. Paul writes to the Christians in Colossae, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Notice in the first two verses, the Apostle Paul, as the Spirit of God is speaking through him, is talking about where the focus of our mind should be. Our mind can go anywhere, but ultimately it goes where we want it to go. So Paul says, since you've been raised with Christ, or since you're a believer, since you're a new creation, he says, verse 1, set your heart on things above. Heart in the Bible is our mind connected to our emotions. It's our affections. It's our priority. Paul says, you put that on things that are above. And that simply means things that are important to God. And then he specifies it even more where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, first of all, what is he not saying? He's saying, hey, don't think about your checkbook. He's not saying don't think about financial planning. You don't think about where you live. He's not saying don't think anything about this life. The Apostle Paul here instead is talking about simply your priorities. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Our greatest vision should be that of going on to be with God in eternity. Our greatest plans are not to be about our retirement years, or acquiring a second home, or envisioning what we're going to do uh, in the future that's all limited to this earth. Those things are fine, and they're not sinful in and of themselves, but they're simply not to be our priority. A lot of times the things that we talk about the most are reflections of our priorities. And if you find yourself always talking in your own mind or with others about, I plan to live here and I plan on doing this in two weeks and then I'm going to do this in ten weeks and then ten years from now I plan on being over here, probably your mind is focused on earthly things. That's what Paul is saying not to do. He says, set your mind on things that are above. That is, things that are important to God. So instead you're thinking about what you're going to do next week to help someone. Or you're thinking, hey, maybe in my older years I might want to live here so I can be a blessing to this group of people. Or I can be blessed by this group. You're thinking like, hey, where will I be best suited for God's service as I advance in my years? You're thinking that way because your mind is set on things that are above. That's all a part of working towards mental growth. Notice Paul here connects it to our conversion. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Again, becoming a Christian changes everything. Our bodies belong to God, temple of the Holy Spirit, our minds to be set on things that are above. Look how this works out mentally um, in a very specific way. Look at the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Look at what God wants us to think about. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, 
whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why don't you stop for a moment? All the things that the Apostle Paul mentions here that we're to think about are positive things. They're constructive things. They're things that are pleasing to God. Again, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Again, our mind goes where we take it. Think about all the things you could take your mind to. Uh, some people love the tabloids. I remember as a kid going through the grocery store and checking out. And uh, there the Globe and the Inquirer and all these things. And all these stories about what Hollywood people were doing and uh, things they were engaged in and shocking behaviors and, and things like that. Uh, they wanted you to open it up right there. And things really haven't changed. You think of all the, the shows about what stars are doing and, uh, and all the directions your mind could go for entertainment. A lot of movies, they center on who got killed and how they get killed and TV shows about crime and the true story and things like that where we tend to be constantly exposed to things that are wrong or at best negative. Paul is saying here to the Philippian Christians, do the opposite. Focus on what is lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Think about such things. That means you're going to have to discriminate. And there's a wrong discrimination, and there's a right discrimination. And for Christians, there's a right discrimination. We're always thinking about what we're bringing into our mind. And sometimes even exercising discrimination, walking the, watching the news is good. I mean, you're going to be bombarded with everything that people did bad that day, that they could collect, because that's always the most interesting to us. But every once in a while, we'll have stories about people that help someone, or they invented some device that is some kind of assistive technology to help people that have mobility issues and things like that. That's a praiseworthy thing where someone devoted their time to helping mankind rather than hurting it. He says, focus on that. Instead of wanting to hear neighborhood gossip, focus on what is true. Focus when someone says, hey, did you hear what someone did? Oh, they helped this person yesterday find a new home. And, oh, that's a good thing. That is true. That's admirable. It's excellent. It's praiseworthy. Don't be a trafficker in gossip and, oh, did you hear what somebody did? Or, or do you know what someone did down the street? Or did you hear about this? Don't always get caught up in that. It'll always be the most interesting thing. That is bad things. But the best things you kind of have to search for. You'll find them here at church. When we talk about the things of God and we participate in the Lord's Supper, when, they sing, when we sing these songs, these are the praiseworthy things. He says, focus on this. That is mental growth. The next one. Work towards spiritual growth. First of all, grow in your saved state. I just want to look at one of these texts. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is spiritual growth from God's standpoint. With Jesus in Luke 2, 52, it said, Jesus grew in favor with God. Here's what in favor of God looks like for us as we grow as believers. Peter says in verse 1, chapter 2, Therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Verse 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may, what? Grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's look back at verse 1. There's things that God wants us to jettison from our lives. That is to kick out and close the door on. 
He says, get rid of malice. That means going after someone to try to hurt them, either by your words or your actions. He says, get rid of all deceit. That is lying, whether it be to impress others or to get yourself out of a jam. He says, get rid of that. That's, that's a wrong mindset. He says, get rid of hypocrisy. That is, don't be one thing at church and something different on Friday night. He says, get rid of that. That's hypocrisy. He says, get rid of envy. Get rid of always being angry about what someone else has that you don't have. He says, get rid of that. He says, get rid of slander. That is talking bad about other people. Talking down other people. He says, don't do that. He says, do the opposite. Verse 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Newborn babies crave milk. Remember when my daughters were small, when they wanted to eat, there is a distinctive cry, and mothers, you know this. When babies want to eat, their cry is different from the frustrated, angry cry or the, the pouting cry. There's a piercing sound to that cry when they want to eat that parents cannot ignore, and that's by God's design. You're not going to put off that, feeding that baby for half an hour. You're going to feed that baby right now, and mothers will have to leave the store. Just to, that cry is going to intensify because the babies are craving that. That's all they want is to eat when they're little. And what Peter is saying here by the Spirit of God is that that should be your mindset as well as a believer. That you should constantly crave spiritual milk. Well, what is that? It's something that nourishes your soul. Well, first, you're not going to find that on Netflix. You're not going to find it on CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox. You're going to find it where? In Scripture. Or in any setting where the things of God are discussed and taken seriously. So obviously, church services become a very important time in your life where you're craving spiritual milk and you're putting yourself in the place where that milk will be dispensed, things that will shape and build your life in the best of ways. At home, you might be listening to gospel music. Or you'll be bringing in teaching on YouTube from different teachers that helps you grow and be what you should be. Because we're always fighting against what we should not be. Remember Paul said, get rid of deceit, hypocrisy, envy. We're always trying to push out the bad, but we've got to take in the good too. So he says, crave pure spiritual milk so that you might grow up in your salvation. God does not want you at the same place spiritually you were 30 years ago. We're always to be growing. From the day that we're baptized till the day that God calls us home, we're always growing, working on the things that are unacceptable, tossing them out with the trash, but taking in the good. The things that we find in Scripture and you'll never have learned enough. You'll never have got to the point where I think I know it all now. You're always seeking to grow, not just the facts and the figures and what's interesting historically, but you'll always be looking at what does God want for me? How does He want my life to be different today than it was yesterday? We're always a work in progress, and that's how we see ourselves spiritually. Again, it said of Jesus, He grew in favor with God, and He never stopped growing. And neither should we. We're always to grow spiritually. Look at another text that confirms that before we go on to our next point. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Look at the focus here upon spiritual growth. Romans 12, verse 1. Here Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. First of all, notice in verse 1, what we saw earlier, it says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's physical growth. Our entire person belongs to God. So he says, offer to God as a living sacrifice. We're always on the altar of God, giving our lives to Him. He says, this is our true worship. We honor and worship God by how we live. To make it more clear, he says in verse 2, do not conform or don't be shaped 
by the pattern of this world. That is, don't let your life be shaped by the lives you see on TV. Those are not our models. And what's important to our culture is not what's most important to us. Again, what's important to our culture is not to be what's most important to us. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, ever changed by the renewing of your mind. That spiritual growth that we might be able to test and approve what God's will is. Those that are growing spiritually are always asking themselves, is this how God wants me to use my time? Is this the place where God wants me to be? Or does God want me dwelling on this thought or having this priority? Is this where my life ought to be? Again, Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. We're always asking, is this how a person ought to live who's been saved by the blood of Christ? You know, if we get a negative answer to that, God doesn't want us going on some guilt trip spiritually. Where we're always full of guilt and shame, but instead He's looking for growth. Where we acknowledge what's wrong, yeah, I need to work on that, or what I said, and those thoughts, or how I'm spending my time. Yes, it needs to be more in line with what God wants, but then we go on to the growth. We don't constantly beat ourselves up about the things that aren't right. God's not looking for that. He's looking for Christians that always want to grow. And this is what growth looks like. Our bodies belong to God. Our minds are transformed, constantly being renewed. And he says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're always asking, what is God's will for my life? What is the best and the right thing to do in this situation? That is spiritual growth. The last one, work towards social growth. Work towards social growth. Again, it said Jesus grew up. He grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with God. And he grew in favor with people. In my previous thoughts, building this lesson, make the second commandment of priority simply meant to love our neighbors ourselves. The first priority was to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, but the second priority is simply to love our neighbor as ourself. But what that means is to do what you can do to be a blessing to others. In our last text, I want to look back at Romans 12. We looked at verses 1 and 2. But I want to look at now verses 13 through 21. And notice how all of this teaching focuses on how we treat other people. Verse 13. Paul says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not think you are superior. Let's just pause here and go back to verse 13. Here, one of the things that we can do to socially be what God wants us to be is share with the Lord's people who are in need whether that need be physical need or monetary need, but sometimes it might be emotional need. Sometimes you have to spend enough time with someone and to listen to them to kind of figure out what a person needs. Their need may not be money. Uh, their need might be to learn responsibilities or, or learn accountability. But God's person is always looking to see what a person truly needs. He says, practice hospitality, verse 13. That doesn't always mean just having someone over to your house. That could be part of the application. But hospitality means instead of kind of keeping to yourself all the time, you're looking to engage people, especially people you don't know. 
Hospitality fundamentally means a love of strangers. That doesn't mean it's always easy to talk to someone you don't know or, you, or that you always enjoy it. But it simply means you know that's what God wants you to do. That is engage other people. He says practice hospitality, verse 13. Then in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So if there's someone at work that really is bothering you and always seems to be out to get you by their words or their actions, he says, don't retaliate against them. Pray for them. Show good back to them when they're showing bad to you. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. So when you hear someone got a promotion or they were able to move into a new house, you rejoice with them. Instead of becoming envious of them or jealous, you rejoice, hey, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. But it also means you stop long enough to listen to them and to find out, wow, something really good just happened in their life, which means they have to be talking and not you. Sometimes our challenge is simply to listen to other people's lives. He says, mourn with those who mourn. When someone experiences something sad or there's heartbreak over maybe their child or their grandchild or a friendship that's estranged, something like that, uh, you listen to that and you catch it. Hey, that must really hurt that person. And you tell them, I'm really sorry you're going through that. You don't try to give them five solutions to it. We always want to give solutions before a person even finishes their sentence. But instead, tell them, I'm sorry you're going through that, and that must really hurt. That's mourning with those that mourn. That's being socially sensitive. You're growing socially if you do that. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Just stop there, boy. Uh, we all know at times people in church can't even get along with each other. That obviously has to be corrected, but with our neighbors, with our coworkers, the people that we see all the time. It says, make a point to get along with them. Not to always be at odds with them or giving them the silent treatment or refusing to engage them. Do the opposite. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Be willing, verse 16, to associate with people of low position. Do not think you're superior. We need that socially, don't we? Uh, I don't think too many of us are walking around like the Howells. Remember the Howells from Gilligan's Island? The rich couple on the island. Uh, that's an extreme example, if you remember that at all. But basically he says, don't think you're better than someone else. Don't think you're above talking to certain people just because they have nothing to give. He says, make sure you're associating with people of low position, people that maybe don't live in the same circumstances you do. Verse 17 now. Repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The greatest pinnacle of social development is when people do bad things to you, whether they lie to you, they take advantage of you, that you don't seek, how can I get back at them? Oh, what can I say the next time they call? Oh, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to. Some people actually practice how they're going to get back at someone verbally. They're not going to pull a gun, but they're going to use the weapon of the tongue and how they're going to really let someone have it. Paul says don't do that. Don't tear someone down with your words even though you were hurt. You can still confront. You can still tell someone how they hurt you, but don't look to get even with them. Do not repay evil for evil. If that person needs to be punished. Paul says let God take care of that. As much as is possible, live at peace with everyone. Some people don't want peace. And you might have to distance yourself from someone that's always trying to stir up conflict at home or at work. You can have boundaries in your life. But don't make yourself part of the problem. By always having to respond back to every comment. 
or engage in chiming in when someone's talking bad about them. Oh, yeah, 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 they did that. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that. That's social growth to reject that. Instead, find out what is good. Try to appreciate the good things about people. Look for those things. That is social growth. And there's many other texts to look at that talk about how that's a priority uh, for God's people. Four areas God's always looking at. Physical growth, our body belongs to God. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Make sure your body is only doing things God wants it to do, or you're only taking in things that help your body think better and clear for God's purpose. Mental growth. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Your mind should be constantly renewed in the things of God. Spiritual growth. Crave things that help you grow as a person in the eyes of God. Look to be better tomorrow than you are today. Always look for areas that need attention. And then social growth. God's not looking for hermits. He doesn't want you to live in a monastery anywhere. He doesn't want you living as a recluse. He wants you as the light of the world. Always be engaged with other people. And make sure you're a blessing to their life and not someone they're trying to avoid because you're messing up their life. Be someone that bring, brings the blessings of Christ to them so they appreciate being around you, whether it be for your listening or your empathy or your gentle care and compassion. Be a blessing to the lives of others. And you'll be growing. You'll be growing up God's way in the four areas of our life that He's always looking for growth. Our challenge is to do this every day. And remember that you and I have an enemy that's trying to do just the opposite. To take us another direction. And Jesus simply calls that person the evil one. Reject him and his temptations. And instead, accept these areas as areas of growth that God will always be looking at till the day that he calls you home. Never give up on yourself. God's not going to give up on you. He's never going to accept less than what he knows you could be. Every day is a new day for growth. Wake up knowing that. This is a new day for growth.